thanks, Rob. That's a really wonderful introduction. Um, so as Rob said, I'm going to talk mainly about female audiences and film noir, uh, but I will circle back to the women who made noir as part of, uh, towards the second half of the talk. So I have not lost sight of the topic of this film festival. Um, I, it's such an honor to be here. I can't wait to see the films and, and hear the introductions that um, are going to be happening throughout this week. It's, it's really exciting. Um, <clears throat> so when Kansas City Confidential was released in late 1952, audiences were promised a film that hit with bullet force and blackjack fury. One critic noted how brawls and beatings permeated the picture, and another complained that violence suffuses and corrupts this measly film. The film's promotional campaign, as you can see, repeatedly featured its male stars, John Payne and Preston Foster, in violent interactions. Yet, Kansas City Confidential's marketing program also included a national tie-in with Avon Cosmetics. The film's female lead, Colleen Gray, appeared in Avon ads published in Ladies Home Journal and other high circulation women's magazines, and promotional material was tucked into Avon sales kits distributed by the company's legion of door-to-door -door saleswomen with the hope that Avon might pre-sell Kansas City Confidential to female moviegoers. This marketing campaign might seem out of step with the violent, volatile masculinity that pervades other elements of the film's ad campaign, yet it is utterly typical of marketing programs for most film noir in the 1940s and early 50s, virtually all of which solicited female patronage through fashion and beauty merchandising. Clothing, jewelry, cosmetics, skincare, hair products, were featured in national tie-in campaigns for the vast majority of films we now consider key to the noir cycle, even the most seemingly male-oriented pictures. Most campaigns featured female stars and were targeted to female moviegoers. Readers would have encountered these ad campaigns in large circulation glossy monthlies, including women's magazines, general interest magazines like Life and Look, and movie fan magazines. As an example of the broad scope of this advertising, consider that Max Factor Cosmetics were featured in tie-in campaigns for Double Indemnity and Gilda. Lux Soap was featured in tie-in campaigns for The Postman Always Rings Twice, The Stranger, Secret Beyond the Door. Woodbury and Overglow Cosmetics were featured in tie-in campaigns for Out of the Past, Pitfall, and The Blue Dahlia. And Lies sold sunglasses to promote brute force. And Martha Vickers and, Barbara, and Laura McCall sold pearl, pearls as part of a promotional campaigns for The Big Sleep and Key Largo. The reach of this advertising was profound. The press book for 1949's Criss Cross boasted that 20 million readers would see tie-in ads for Woodbury Face Powder featuring that film star, Yvonne DiCarlo. National tie-in campaigns were only one arm of fashion and beauty promotions aimed at female moviegoers. Women reading daily newspapers would also have encountered considerable publicity for film noir, much of it tailored to their presumed interests in fashion and beauty. For press books provided exhibitors with fashion mats like these that could stock the women's pages of local papers. Exhibitors showing conflict, as you'll see, were offered fashion features for your femme fans that showcased stars Alexis Smith and Rose Hobart in a series of dramatic hats, an item of feminine apparel always of prime reader appeal, according to the press book. The press book for Dead Reckoning offered a newspaper layout of fashions to be reckoned with, featuring star Elizabeth Scott. Press books also encouraged theater owners to reach out to local merchants for local tie-in opportunities, offering images that might be incorporated into window displays in local clothing boutiques, hairdressers, and jewelry stores. Exhibitors were told they could catch the eye of women with smart fashion stills featuring Gun Crazy's Peggy Cummins. Um, and the exhibitors uh, booking the Blue Dahlia might ask lo local dress shops to designate a shade of Dahlia blue clothing during that film's run, as the press book recommended. Those showing Ride the Pink Horse might encourage shop owners to feature pink lingerie or pink cosmetics. It's not too late for Columbia area. <laughs> <laughs> Sewing pattern tie-ins were another common promotional tactic of this era. They enabled women to copy star fashions by sewing their own replica garments. 
Home sewing had enjoyed a pronounced renaissance during the Second World War, when many women took up the practice as a cost-saving measure. When the fan magazine Photoplay began featuring a pattern of the month in 1947, patterns for outfits worn by female characters in many film noir titles were offered, including the one for Desert Fury that you see here. Paramount's lead designer, Edith Head, emphasized the practicality and economy of home sewing when the suit she designed for that film was featured. So it's important to emphasize that none of these marketing techniques were unique to film noir in the 1940s and early 50s. At this point, the culture of cross-promotion between Hollywood, the fashion industry, and beauty culture was well established. Female stars endorsed cosmetics, beauty products, and clothing lines. Product tie-ins featuring those same stars were central to most films' marketing campaigns. And fashion-oriented publicity saturated the market for upcoming releases, enticing female moviegoers with a promised convergence of display window and movie screen. Movie fan magazines, catering to a lower middle class, largely female readership, offered what Sumiko Higashi characterizes as an uninterrupted flow of ads for a commodified representation of femininity from cover to cover. Women's magazines, which had some of the largest circulations of any magazines of this era, also provided a crucial vector between Hollywood and its female customers, offering what Marjorie Ferguson called a particular female worldview of the desirable, the possible, the purchasable. Consumption was integral to achieving the feminine ideal during these years, Kathy Pice notes, since constantly changing product lines compelled consumers to continually interrogate, experiment with, and renew their looks. All of this was accelerated in the post-World War II consumer boom, of course. Freed from wartime restrictions, the fashion industry underwent a tremendous revival, and cosmetics companies began to produce an astonishing array of products with new colors and lines featured each and every season. Fashion-oriented movie marketing campaigns invited women to engage in intimate self-fashioning in relation to female stars and female characters on screen. As Jackie Stacy argues, Hollywood fashion culture promoted an intense intimacy between spectators and stars, linked, as she says, through a common dream in which clothes are the currency of a shared femininity. Donning fashions to match one's favorite star, styling one's hair to copy hers, grooming one's body to look like hers, and painting one's face in her style, all required an extraordinary shared intimacy with that star. So however typical of Hollywood marketing ploys, this shared intimacy between female stars and female fans becomes particularly striking in the world of film noir. First, because the noir landscape is otherwise completely devoid of such intimate attachments. And second, because the women featured in film noir, femme fatales, who are utterly compelling for their strength, their power, the sheer force of their desire, were understood, even at the time, to be outside traditional feminine norms. Take, for instance, oh, I'm behind on my slides. I'm oh, sorry. Um, um, take, for instance, the 1945 think piece, Now the Girls Are Rugged, that called attention to the tough and tumble characters played by today's hard-boiled movie dames, including Barbara Sandwick, Claire Trevor, Anne Sheridan, and Lauren McCall. These he women, as the piece dubbed them, set themselves against the frilly femininity embodied by an earlier generation of stars like Lillian Gish and Mary Pickford. Virtually all of the actresses mentioned in this piece, it should be noted, were already associated with key roles in early film noir, like Belle and Demnity, Stanwyck, Murder My Sweet, Trevor, and They Drive By Night, Sheridan. It was these women's clothing and makeup styles that female moviegoers were encouraged to admire and emulate. As fashion film historian Sarah Berry reminds us, stars like these personalized particular types of femininity that could be symbolically appropriated through fashion. So in order to unpack the dissonance between conventional fashion-oriented movie marketing on the one hand and the wholly unconventional women in film noir, 
I want to take a closer look at four different campaigns. Out of the Past provides a particularly compelling example of how female-oriented marketing tactics like sewing pattern tie-ins become skewed in the landscape of film noir. So photoplay readers were offered a pattern for the striking outfit that star Jane Greer wears in the film's final scenes. Why this costume? Greer appears in beautiful clothing throughout the film, including a tight-fitting white dress she wears when her character Kathy Moffat is introduced in Acapulco, and a loose peasant-style dress she wears to meet Robert Mitchum's character on the beach at night. Like most of the clothing Kathy wears in the first half of the film, both dresses are light in color and make her body seem to glow on screen. Towards the end of the film, Kathy wears dark colors almost exclusively. The outfit she wears in the film's final scene, available for viewers to purchase in a sewing pattern, is especially dark. But viewers would not have known it was blood red until they saw the pattern advertised in photoplay. It's a fitting color, for when Kathy is first seen in the outfit, she's just murdered her lover. She continues to try and assert control over the male protagonist until the end, but is ultimately killed in a hail of police bullets that he engineers, all the while wearing the blood red coat. So, put more plainly, the outfit promoted as Photoplay's pattern of the month was the costume Kathy wears when she is at her most violent and simultaneously also the target of violence. Did pattern makers and studio publicists believe that women would have been so transfixed by Greer's clothing and out of the past that they would not have cared or remembered what her character was doing while wearing it? <laughs> this is unlikely, especially for a costume worn during such a startling climactic sequence. More likely, as Janie Place suggested so long ago, viewers reveled in the strength and power exhibited by a font the tall like Kathy Moffat in spite of the fact that she is punished and killed in the end. It's not their inevitable demise we remember, Place said, but rather their strong, dangerous, and above all, exciting sexuality. So in fashioning themselves after women like Kathy Moffat, female viewers were offered an opportunity to outfit themselves like these compelling women, to align themselves with the power they exerted, but also to acknowledge the violence enacted against them. Film noir, famed for its violent eroticism and eroticized violence, takes on a chilling hue for women asked to slip into the font the tall's clothes. The fashion-oriented promotional campaign for Too Late for Tears showcases even more plainly the complexity of a font the tall's desires, the monumental violence perpetuated to contain those desires, and the female viewer-consumer caught in between. So fans could sew their own versions of a dress worn by Elizabeth Scott, another featured photo play pattern of the month, or if they had the means, they could purchase a reproduction of a suede jacket Scott wore in the film. Scott's character in Too Late for Tears, Jane Palmer, was an especially ruthless, cold-blooded, and murderous fun at all. Um, as avaricious and cold-blooded as they come, according to Motion Picture Daily. Um, Jane's goals and desires drive the film from its opening scene. A desire for money, the independence it will accord her from men, from lower middle class precarity, and from conventional femininity. As Jane explains at one point, I've been waiting for it dreaming of it my whole life. <laughs> her desire is, of course, absolutely deadly for all who stand in her way. She murders her husband, then later her slimy co-conspirator, played by Dan Durgay, who you see here. Um, Jane commits the second murder while wearing the suede jacket offered to female consumers through the movie's tie-in campaign. So like the outfit in conjunction with Out of the Past, this is clothing worn by the film's fond fatale when she is at her most murderous and deviant. Women invited to covet the Scott jacket, as it was called, perhaps to purchase it if they had the money, were thus also invited to occupy a position of transgressive white femininity, to feel the big dangerous desires that Scott's character inhabits, to imagine a life beyond domesticity and heterosexual marriage. 
but they were ultimately invited to channel those desires into consumption and self-adornment, purchasing a jacket or sewing a dress, rather than, for instance, stealing money and murdering your husbands, as Scott's character does. <laughs> but the film's fashion merchandising program, Hollywood's reflex marketing pitch to women during this era, was clouded, if not completely undermined, by the film's own message. So, Too Late for Tears is, above all, a film about greed, about the dangers that consumer culture poses, particularly for women, where money offers not only the promise of pretty things, but an opportunity to live beyond the strictures of heterosexual marriage and patriarchal culture. So, the avaricious housewife, Jane Palmer, is the villain of the film. The film presents Jane's yearning for a life beyond lower middle class precarity as profoundly troubling, if not lethal, all the, way, all the while inviting women to purchase or sew clothing they had seen Jane wearing on screen. Um, so there's another aspect of the film's promotional campaign that we need to consider here. The film's clothing titans were embedded within a larger publicity campaign that repeatedly highlighted gendered violence. Uh, posters, lobby cards, and magazine ads all featured an image of Scott being beaten by co-star Duryea. Not only that, adjacent marketing materials promoted violence against women, <laughs> with pre-written publicity pieces touting scientists prove women like to be treated rough, and dubbing Scott, she who gets slapped. <laughs> Central to the film's marketing program, then, was the punishment and containment of the femme fatale's ferocious desire. Women invited to purchase the jacket worn by Scott on screen and thus to slip into her character's fantasies and desires would almost certainly have seen this publicity too. Women asked to admire fashions worn by noir's female stars, to fantasize about owning and wearing them, to inhibit those characters' desires, inhabit, pardon me, inhabit those characters' desires, were simultaneously confronted with a reminder about the violent punishment enacted to contain those desires. Another example from the Lourdes, from Lourdes highlights the entanglement of noir's gendered violence and female-oriented publicity campaigns even more clearly. The film star, Lucille Ball, appeared in a national tie-in campaign for Max Factor Lipstick, with ads placed in 12 glossy monthlies that included a mix of fashion magazines, women magazines, and movie fan magazines. Ball was also featured in a national tie-in campaign with Butterick, that offered sewing patterns for outfits her character had worn in the film, highlighted in a two-page spread in Woman's Home Companion. Alongside these national campaigns, the film's press book suggested multiple avenues for local promotion, including fashion layouts that could be published in daily papers, publicity items about Ball's hairdo or the rare mink coat her character wears in the film, and film stills that might be offered to local merchants for display cases and shop windows. Once again, Sales tactics such as these were not at all remarkable for a Hollywood film of this era, except that Lourdes is a film about a serial killer, and Ball plays a young woman who is coerced into acting as bait to lure the killer to the police. The film's rhyming tagline, glamorous bait for an amorous killer, explicitly linked the film's beauty and fashion promotional campaigns and the glamour they promised with sexual violence. It's important to emphasize, moreover, that the notion of a serial killer preying on women would not have been an abstract concept at the time. Lourdes was released in September of 1947, just nine months after the highly publicized murder of Elizabeth Short in Los Angeles, the famed Black Dahlia murder. What is more, the film's press book encouraged exhibitors to piggyback on Short's murder in order to publicize screenings of Lourdes, mentioning the crime by name and suggesting several related exploitation stunts. Exhibitors could sponsor a contest where movie tickets would be awarded to women who best described how I lured my man. <laughs> Local merchants could be encouraged to provide tie-ins for fashion and beauty products on their shelves, what the press book dubbed glamour and beauty aids in luring. Or local newspapers might feature a story on similar murders of local women embellished with scenes from the picture. In other words, women were being encouraged to act as glamorous bait for a serial killer with the film's fashion tie-ins at the same time 
as they were reminded of how many local women had been victims of violent sex crimes. If fashion and beauty tie-ins for lured, enticed female moviegoers by engaging legitimate fears of sexual harassment and sexual violence that they might experience in their own communities, promotions for framed connected beauty campaigns to violence that could be a lot closer to home. Virtually every piece of visual advertising designed for the film, posters, lobby cards, magazine ads, highlighted violence against the central female character. Calling the film a rugged romance that featured man-woman conflict, the press book encouraged exhibitors to play out these elements in their promotions, providing a mock-up of an eye-grabbing theater front that included three different images of this violence. You can see that down in the bottom back there. This was entirely typical for noir promotions, of course, where sexual violence and violent sexuality were often selling points. But it's vital to consider how such imagery inflected fashion-oriented marketing more specifically targeted to the film's female customers. Actress Janice Carter, the film's female lead, was featured in a national tie-in campaign for Max Factor Face Powder, touting the product's abilities to bring a surprising new loveliness to your makeup. Um, <laughs> Ads appeared in both women's magazines and movie fan magazines. A reader flipping through the May 1947 issue of the fan magazine Modern Screen, for instance, would have seen both a full-page ad for the movie and the Max Factor face powder tie-in ad that was published on the issue's inside back cover. Moreover, this sequence an image of violence centering the film's female star, followed by an image of that same woman, smiling and made up, might prompt a reader to conclude that Max Factor face powder would be useful in covering over visible evidence of partner violence. Rather than being invited to imagine themselves glamorous bait for a serial killer then, as they were with Lourdes, women were instead invited to consider the violence in their own relationships. While there was little public discussion of domestic violence in American life at the time, there was considerable discussion of the problem of demobilizing male combat veterans in the immediate post-war years. Much of this discourse encouraged women to revert to traditional femininity and to adopt a caretaking role as they adjusted to a newly volatile masculinity. Make him feel secure, one author advised. Tolerate his outbursts. So these Four examples of fashion-oriented marketing campaigns that targeted female viewers for film noir tell us several things. First, there was a considerable effort to cultivate a female audience for film noir in the 1940s and early 50s, a finding that challenges conventional wisdom, which is almost always inferred that noir's original audience was largely, if not wholly, male. Second, while the marketing strategies used to entice female moviegoers to noir titles were utterly consistent with gender marketing norms of the era that emphasized fashion, cosmetics, and self-adornment for women, those tactics took on a wholly new resonance in noir's landscape of violence and violent desire. Sewing pattern promotions, clothing tie-ins, cosmetic ads encouraged female moviegoers to foster intimate attachments with noir's female characters and stars, women understood, even at the time, to be outside the norms of conventional femininity and subject to violent punishment as a result. OK, so I want to pivot now to consider another feature of film noir marketing that also targeted women. And now I want to think about the two together. This second tactic was relatively unique to noir in this period, but I think it complicates the situation even further. So alongside the fashion and beauty-oriented promotional campaigns focused on female stars that I've just discussed, film noir was also sold to women through a publicity that highlighted the careers of female producers working behind the scenes on noir titles. So three key female producers were profiled in the fan magazine Screenland, in early 1946, so early in the cycle. Harriet Parsons, oop, my slides are out of order. Um, 
This is John Harrison, a producer of five noirs, including the landmark 1944 title, Phantom Lady. Um, she was profiled in February. Let's see where we're going here. Um, this is Harriet Parsons, who was profiled in January, where she received the moniker Gal Producer. And then uh, Virginia Vanna, producer of the highly influential Gilda, was profiled in June while the film was still in release. These Screenland profiles were not unique. The Gal Producers were frequently profiled in other fan magazines, in general interest monthlies like Life and Parade and in syndicated newspapers, all of which published interviews with the women and stories about their lives and careers, usually timed to coincide with the release of films they had produced. A wide readership would have encountered publicity about noir's female producers during these years then, including both devoted cinephiles who kept up with all of the latest Hollywood news and more casual moviegoers browsing daily newspapers and monthly magazines. It's worth emphasizing that this kind of wide-ranging publicity was extremely unusual for Hollywood executives. Harrison, Parsons, and Van Alp received a celebrity treatment, complete with glamorous portraits, photo spreads of their homes and their work environments, and detailed accounts of their career histories and private lives that had no parallel for the industry's male executives. In fact, there's little evidence that male producers were ever profiled in fan magazines or mass market magazines of the day. Profiles of the gal producers frequently underscored the strong authorial role that these women played on their projects, with some reporters even taking the task of enlightening their readers on the exact nature of a producer's job. As Parsons explained to one journalist, a producer is the picture's overall boss. Illustrated photo spreads reinforce this message. I'm going to skip it. My slides are out of order here. I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, illustrated photo spreads reinforce this message, depicting the producers on set collaborating with directors, actors, and crew, while also emphasizing the roles they played in pre-production planning and post-production by documenting their work with editors, designers, and publicists. Promotional materials such as these that cast Harrison, Van Alp, and Parsons as leading creative forces behind the productions, even their central authors, were key ingredients in the larger campaign to market film noir to female viewers. With studios especially cognizant of the need to cater to female moviegoers during the war years when noir first emerged, it's no accident that so much publicity focused on the female producers who played such a pivotal role in the evolution of the cycle. Press coverage of the gal producers often championed their ability to cater to this vital segment of the audience. Noting Van Ops 1945 appointment at Columbia with approval, the Hollywood Reporter suggested, with millions of American men in uniform fighting overseas, the box office in this country is learning, leaning more heavily than ever on women ticket buyers. Female leadership was needed in the industry, the reporter insisted, in order to ensure that a woman's angle remained a focus of attention. The LA Examiner put it even more bluntly in a profile of Parsons. Though the industry focuses much of its efforts on products with feminine appeal, few are made under the guidance of a feminine hand. What is more, Reports often revealed that these gal producers understood the tastes of women differently than an industry that had long catered to female moviegoers with romance, musicals, and women's weepies. Female audiences, these profiles insisted, had a taste for crime and violence. We'll go back to Harrison here. Um, Hollywood's only film producer thinks there's nothing lovelier than a nice juicy homicide, Collier's Magazine told its readers in a 1943 piece on Joan Harrison entitled Murder, she said. After the success of Phantom Lady, Harrison proposed two highly unorthodox product, projects, a murder story involving children and a film made entirely by women. Neither plan was realized in the end, but Harrison's decision to speak publicly about her ideas suggests how keenly her persona was tied to a radical reconception of Hollywood as an industry not simply run by women, but a certain breed of women who rejected the industry's long-standing conception of its female patrons. Um, 
Um, meeting profiles also contributed to ongoing conversations about women's work during and immediately after the Second World War, when ideas about women's labor were considerably expanded. Profiles often giddily retold tales of how the women had been mistaken for more traditionally feminine movie studio employees, unsettling accustomed expectations about women's work. Not only were they working successfully in a job traditionally held by men, they also explicitly rejected roles often prescribed for women in Hollywood, a stance made clear by the oft-repeated anecdote about Harrison being mistaken for an actress on the set of Phantom Lady. Harrison also frequently recounted how she'd been a bad secretary when working for Alfred Hitchcock at the outset of her career, a job performance that allowed her to segue into working with him as a script supervisor, a screenwriter, and then a trusted collaborator. So upsetting long-standing ideas about women's work, these stories suggested, involved either refusing typical assignments like actress or secretary, or simply performing them badly, as Harrison did, as a means of advancement. The work experiences Harrison, Parsons, and Van Up enjoyed were by no means unique to the film industry during these years. Indeed, there's considerable reason to believe that their professional lives, at least as framed in these publicity accounts, would have resonated with large numbers of women in the 1940s, most working in far less glamorous industries than Hollywood. As labor historians have documented, the war years generated considerable shifts in both the reality of women's working lives and perceptions about women's work more generally. Many women joined the paid labor force for the first time, but even more significantly, women who had always worked, working class women, women of color, found new opportunities in higher paying jobs in industrial manufacturing, a good portion of which had been previously held exclusively by men. So sometimes, publicity about the gal producers explicitly aligned their accomplishments in Hollywood with this wider field of opportunities open to women during the war years. One 1942 item tied Parsons' advancement through the ranks of RKO directly to wartime conditions, observing that by the hundreds and thousands, young American women are taking over important jobs in every profession. Noting Harrison's appointment at Universal in 1943, Variety concluded femme influence in the surrounding airplane plants in San Fernando Valley has permeated the studio. But when questioned themselves, both women sought to disentangle their accomplishments from the wartime contexts. New opportunities had not been created for producers during the war, they emphasized, because so few male producers were away fighting overseas. Both emphasized that they would have pursued opportunities to produce regardless of the war, and that they aimed to continue producing films after the war ended. Theirs were not temporary accomplishments facilitated by the upheavals of wartime, the women insisted, but hard-won career goals. These sentiments would have resonated with a considerable number of other working women at the time. A 1944 survey conducted by the Federal Department of Labor, for instance, found that the vast majority of women employed in industrial manufacturing during the war not only planned to remain in the labor force at the end of the conflict, but hoped to keep their current posts. Stories of self-transformation and social mobility might have held particular appeal for working class women and women of color, women who had always worked, but who found opportunities for more lucrative and rewarding work during the war. In fact, Van Up, Harrison's, and Parsons were featured together in a lengthy 1944 write-up in the communist newspaper, The People's World and Daily Worker. Hmm where writer Mildred Fleming noted all three women have in common a long record of hard work, training, and experience. Despite their accomplishments, Fleming stressed, barriers still exist against women in an industry that employs so few female executives. And those who attain that rank continue to encounter prejudice, Fleming wrote, offering a model of off-screen professionalism and anti-sexism that would likely have appealed to many women regardless of their own place in the labor market. Hollywood was not an exceptional sphere, these profiles seemed to suggest. Rather, it offered a prominent window on a phenomenon that was visible in many other sectors of employment across the country. So publicity about noir's gal producers not only upended established ideas about feminine tastes, it also emphasized the women's professionalism, the creative control they exercised over their projects, 
and their ability to thrive in a male-dominated field, and the social mobility that professional success had given them. These career narratives offered female fans a different type of intimate self-fashioning than they encountered in fashion and beauty merchandising for the same cycle of films. So did glowing portrayals of ambitious, successful female professionals working behind the scenes on film noir outweigh negative portrayals of deadly femme fatales on screen? Did publicity about noir's female producers counteract images of gendered violence featured so prominently in other noir promotions and often tied directly to the intimate self-fashioning that promotions invited with female stars? I'm not so sure. Fans would have seen these promotions together in a continuum. The deadly femme fatales they saw on screen, the larger-than-life stars who played them and the gal producers who helped create them were all women who defied conventional feminine norms in one way or another. And they were all, therefore, potentially subject to the punitive male violence visited upon so many women on screen, so many women in publicity images, and fans were frequently reminded upon women in their own communities and their own homes. Thank you. conversation if folks have questions or comments or ideas that they want to share. Don't be shy. Thanks. Thank you so much for this. Really appreciate it. I'm sure there's a um, a thread that moves forward to today in how some of these tie-in advertisements um, sort of take advantage of the unfortunate norms within um, sort of the gender reality of um, relationships within the films, but then also within sort of domestic life. Is that something that you've spent some time looking at as well as looking back? I, I have to say I haven't looked as closely at the at contemporary advertising as I have at this. I've been doing a really deep dive into the 40s and 50s. Um, but I think your, height, your hunch is absolutely correct, right? I mean, certainly we know that fashion and beauty merchandising is still a huge part of film promotions and that female stars are, are front and center in that. Um, and it would be very interesting to see if the kinds of links that I'm tracing in noir between those campaigns and violence are, are evident in contempt. I, it would not surprise me at all. At all. I just haven't done that yet. Yeah. Hi. Oh, my gosh. Um, I'm just so interested in the connection to um, the Elizabeth Short murder, and I was wondering if there was any kind of um, echo throughout the film industry in a film, noir film, that was kind of picking up on those themes of, you know, violent murder. Um, is that something that resonated further? Um, well, I think uh, In a Lonely Place, um, which if I'm not mistaken, you're showing, correct? Uh, in a Lonely Place is another film about a serial killer. Um, and so I think that's the first film that comes to mind when I think about that. And of course, its origins are in the Hughes novel, as, as the programming is emphasizing. Um, and it, well, I, won't, I was going to give a spoiler, I won't give a spoiler. There's a spoiler about the adaptation. Um, <laughs> That I mean that that is that's a really interesting thing to think about. I mean I feel like the whole, I mean part of me just wants to answer the whole noir cycle <laughs> is an elaboration of that, and that's maybe not that's not the kind of specifics you're you're interested in, but that's where yeah. <laughs> in, in all the places is definitely in in that territory for sure. Uh, 
Um, I'm really struck in your argument by how you're talking about these means by which women are able to enact these roles of violence, but at the same time, these ad campaigns are nullifying that, um, whether that's through you know traditional beauty means or with the female producers um, showing their home life, showing their good mothers, showing they you know have nice legs and they you know will, will do a good job on set and everything. Um, and just if you think that kind of ties into the femme fatale as a whole, um, that it is just this figure outside of society and how can we make that okay? How can we make that okay in our minds? And especially the fact that so much of this is happening during World War II, um, when the primary thing that's being told to women at that time is make do and mend, which of course ties into the sewing patterns and everything that's going on there. Um, this is a lot. Uh, my question has gotten away from itself. Um, but just that there is this kind of um, nullifying and, and quieting um, to a certain extent within this stretching the bounds of what women can do at the time and in the femme fatale role. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's so interesting because, you know, the, this, the structure that, that film after film after film after film has um, of, you know, powerful and dangerous women being killed off, right, um, is what's so fascinating to me about the publicity campaigns to women is that they are simultaneously amplifying and glorifying those women even more than the films do, and exacting exactly the same punishment. So, so this publicity campaigns reproduce the same arc in a way as the, the films themselves do, um, and but 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 maybe in an even more exaggerated way, right? Um, Thank you. Um, you didn't mention smoking or drinking. <laughs> I would think that, that the uh, tobacco industry and the liquor makers would have seized on this as... There, there are a lot of cigarette ads featuring both male and female noir stars, yes. Um, and I, <laughs> I was really just focused on um, the beauty and fashion but absolutely, there's there's cigarette ads, but there's also you know all sorts of um, I, I I can't tell you all sorts of uh, you know V8 juice carpets, um, chrome furniture, wallpaper. I mean every kind of domestic product tie-in you can imagine um, is is used in relation to wine. Again, it's utterly typical of the films of this period. Um, and I kind of wanted to zero in on the fashion and beauty because it's so targeted to women. But certainly the cigarette art ads were targeted to women as well. They featured both male and female stars. They were in both general, they tended to be more in the general interest magazines than the women's magazines. Um, the male stars advertised, they were far, there was far fewer tiring campaigns with male stars, but beyond cigarettes, there's some for pens, there's some for coffee, there's some for shirts. Um, the, the male stars are far less prominent in this the kind of tie-in campaigns. Hi, I, I was wondering the the, the film title uh, "Phantom Lady" came up a number of times in in, in the in the talk, and you know because it, it seems to be an intersection with a lot of these different things. Uh, you know, it was um, you know produced by Joan Harrison. Uh, but also the, the I, I was and Elle Rain showed up in your mm -hmm. deck like early on, mm -hmm. like promoting hats, but in a different movie. Yeah, yeah. But this is a very straightforward question. Was there anything related to Phantom Lady along the lines of the kind of promotional campaigns that you uh, that you were talking about? Because that's a film that's about a, a very fashionable hat, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and a female detective. Right. Um, yeah. It, there, there wasn't the you, you. The main way that film was promoted was there was a tie-in with the novel, and and Harrison was all of, like it was promoted through her, and it was promoted as like a a, a 
female-centered mystery for female fans made by a woman. She was all over the publicity for that. And so it was le that's an interesting case because it's less about, you think it would be about the fashion, but, but Harrison and her legs were all over the publicity, seriously, all over the publicity for that film. Um, so it's le that, there's less fashion-oriented marketing with Phantom Lady. Yeah, it's, it's really, um, it's about the, the ties to crime fiction, Harrison's authorship, Harrison's love of crime fiction, the way she's, this new taste she's bringing in to, to movies, right? That new, fe new feminine taste for murder. But <laughs> are there some of those, sorry. Are there some of those, uh, I mean, outside of Phantom Lady, which has its hat, you know, then <laughs> we could think about Gilda and the gloves or, um, you know, double indemnity and the ankle bracelet mm -hmm. and you know, things like that. Are there any kind of very direct connections that, that you see being drawn uh, between those kind of costuming choices? There is, oh, I'm, uh, is it Murder My Sweet with the J necklace? Yes, there's a there's a J necklace tie-in for Murder My Sweet, and it's a it's a mystery. Oh, see if I can get this right. It's a mystery related tie-in. Oh, I have another good example. So the, yeah, the, the J from from um, Murder My Sweet, and it is. I'm not remembering all the details, but I think it is. Mm, there's some. It's it's the, the, the idea the stunt is that you would hide it in your theater and it has to be found it's something like that right so it's it's, an, it's involving some sort of search for the thing the uh, the other one that that's really interesting is you'll remember in Dead Reckoning if you've seen it that the another Elizabeth Scott von Fatal she's she's associated with the smell of jasmine right and and the Humphrey Bogart character Rip Murdoch is like before he gets knocked out he smells jasmine and there was a a perfume recognition contest that was suggested in connection with Dead Reckoning. Um, and so both of those examples are interesting because they're diverging a little bit, I think, from what I said here, in that they're suggesting that um, female viewers adopt a sort of detective-like posture in relation to beauty and fashion merchandising, but still that they adopt a kind of detective-like posture. Um, so that the, there are some where it's really tied in, you know, or, or the, you know, like I said, the pink lingerie with Ride the Pink Horse or the blue clothing with Blue Dahlia, just that kind of thing. But sometimes it's very tied into like an item of clothing that's featured in the film or, or perfume that's featured in the film. you were noting between like the gender nonconformity of the figures themselves and the kind of recuperative gesture at hand with the lipstick and the dresses <laughs> even though within that you know the dresses happen to be from scenes that are tacitly acknowledging this nonconforming you know deviant behavior that's super fascinating but yeah. I feel like I'm also wondering whether there are any gestures within the items being marketed towards the kind of uh, masculinized, you know, rugged womanhood um, and how that's played out because it feels like part of your argument is about um, this, yeah, this, this taming and uh, restructuring of those like libidinal urges and I'm curious if there are any deviant deviations. The, I had, I cut out a whole bit about Lauren McCall and slacks um, <laughs> <laughs> because she's, She's really associated, you know, it's, it's a new fashion trend at the time. She's really associated with it, and it's associated with her, the, it's associated with a kind of unconventional femininity, but also the way in which Bacall is supposedly defying Hollywood norms, where she doesn't wear makeup in her regular life, and she wears socks. Um, and so there are both, around the release of The Big Sleep, there's a lot of just like straight up fashion pieces on her wearing slacks, like she's straddling a chair wearing slacks, and it's talking about all the things she can do in her slacks. And then for Dark Passage, there is a, a newspaper mat um, of her wearing, she wears this kind of like velvet slacks outfit in the film, and that's part of the fashion mats. So it, that, I think, is an example of, of a of maybe more subtler fashion than, say, like the blood red coat that Jane Greer wears at the end of all the past. It, it, it's a, 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 and the copy for those 
pieces are really emphasizing how unconventional it is to wear socks and how much she likes doing it. And, um, and then she starts showing up in the in the films and she wears socks in the big sleep and um, Dark Passage. So, yeah, yeah, I cut that out, sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you for this. I, I really feel like I need to watch more and more. It's, this is sort of a very general, like, recommend the question, but are there examples of, of films that sort of didn't conclude in that sort of castrating paranoia? <laughs> um, was there anything redemptive that, any examples? Um, um. There's very few examples. Um, I mean, once in a blue moon, there's a wonky heterosexual couple that sur technically survives the film, but you know they're not really going to be able to. She isn't actually killed, but she's sort of married off um, to a violent guy. Um, I'm, I think you have to be asleep just because I talk about it. Um, I mean, Well, Phantom Lady, Phantom Lady would be one, right? There are, th there are a few films where the central female character is not a femme fatale. She's a she's a detective, or she's like a secretary who's forced to investigate a crime to free her boss, kind of thing. Um, and those those end better. <laughs> but if you're looking for happy endings, noir is not the place to. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to break it to you. <laughs> well, please uh, join me in, oops, in thanking uh, Professor Stamp, and I uh, hope it's one of your Thanks so much.